Good morning. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. We're so glad you're here with us. It's a great day to be together and, and worship the Lord, and we're so glad that you chose to be here with us. Um, we especially want to welcome visitors. If you are a visitor with us, there is a visitor's card inside your bulletin. If you want to rip that off and fill it out, we would love to get to know you a little bit better. Um, just a few announcements. In honor of Mother's Day, we are not going to have any youth activities tonight. Um, and also a reminder that there is no mission kids on Wednesday. Um, and looking ahead a little bit, on May 23rd, that's Saturday, in two weeks, there's going to be a Come Help a Neighbor Day. We'd love to have you guys here at 10 on that Saturday. Um, if you would take a few minutes and just greet those around you. God. Holy, holy, holy. Hymn number two in your hymnal as we stand together.
creator, God, savior of us all, hear our prayers. Make us each a sanctuary where you can dwell, a vessel that gives you praise. As we hear your word today, help us understand Emmanuel is not only Christ with us, but also Christ going ahead of us. As we hear your word spoken and sung, help us feel the real presence of the Spirit whom you sent to give us comfort and to rejoice with us. In you, O oh Lord, help us to seek refuge. Hear our prayers. You are indeed our rock and our fortress. You've redeemed us, O oh Lord, faithful God. Gracious God, you created all of humankind and showed us the importance of relationships with one another. We commend to your care all the families of this congregation, this community, and our world. We pray that each home may be a home where love is felt. We pray for our homes where, instead of love, there are households of hurt and abuse and suffering. We pray for our children, for our youth and adults, recognizing the importance and the gifts of every age as we grow. We pray for our parents, for step-parents and foster parents. We pray for those who are single and those who are married. May your grace be present to all. Grant us wisdom to know where there is no love, courage to act out love for others, and peace to rest in your mercy. Help the commandments of love for you and love for others be our goal for life together. Come to us today, Lord. Amen. What a joy this morning to be able, as we begin worship together, to celebrate the sacrament, the, the act of baptism. It is a reminder to us every time we enter into these waters that we are people of hope. We are people of the empty tomb. And we are reminded of that this morning as one comes saying, I want to be baptized. Jonathan, will you come and join me in the waters? This is Jonathan Mike. As we were talking earlier, uh, just a little bit ago, uh, Jonathan was saying he was trying to decide of which two ways he wanted to enter into the baptismal pool, the traditional way or by cannonball. And I'm glad for you guys' sake that we decided the traditional way because we've got to change the clothes back here. Jonathan came to me a couple of Sunday mornings ago. He came and he said, Matt, I'm ready to be baptized. And I think he would have gone into the baptismal pool that morning. He was that excited about it. And we've had a chance to, to get together and to talk. And Jonathan told me about what he had experienced. Uh, we talked about that when he came down front, that he had been at a passion play and that the story that for years had been the story about Jesus became his story that he was now connected, that he knew that Jesus had died for him, and he wanted to claim that by coming and professing Jesus as his Lord. And that's why he's here this morning to be baptized. Jonathan, who is Jesus? Jesus is my Lord. Upon your profession of faith, it is now my privilege to baptize you, my brother, Jonathan Mike, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We are buried in baptism and raised to walk in a new life. Let's pray together. Holy and loving God, may those of us here who have been baptized this morning, may we feel the waters once again around us. May those of us who look and who see and who give thanks, may we be called out into deeper waters. We thank you for your love and for your saving grace for all of us. In your name we pray. Amen.
passage this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does not bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is my Father's glory, and you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Let us pray. Eternal God, who birthed creation from the dark void of chaos, hear who we are today. Like children who long to be touched, who long to be close, who long to bring all the troubles we have to your lap of order. Indeed, we wonder why life must be as it is for some of us, no chaos all too well. But this is life that you have given, and in spite of all that we may be out of control, we give you gratitude in the face of it all. God, would you birth in us the strength to live knowing that you are beside us when life is hard. So often we may feel that when we come to church that we must be presentable in being blessed. But your word confronts us with the lepers the outcast, the poor, the hungry, the desperate, the prostitutes. And at every step, you are there. Not to offer judgment in our failings, but to seek to be in relationship with us where we find ourselves to be. God, open us to the reality that we need not be all together to be here this morning. From where does hope and healing come? It comes from you, O God. And we give you our wounds, our hurts, and all the chaos that we have, and ask for a gentle word of presence. May we find people to embrace us, May we hear your voice calm the raging storms of life. In all things, help us to find you. For who among us is so proud as to not need you? For all true prayer somehow confesses our absolute dependence on you, God. It is therefore a deep and vital contact that we seek with you. For we pray for when we pray, it is then that we really are. O oh Lord, your prophet has said that the people that have walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of shadow, upon them shall the light shine. May this be our prayer of confidence that you brought us light into this world at its very beginning, so you will bring light into our darkness of our life 
and of our day. We ask this in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, glory. Amen. We'll sing together our hymn of stewardship. If you'll take your bulletin, it's an insert in your bulletin, O Blessed Spring. And if you'll get that, we'll stand together and sing. Shall we pray? Almighty God, we thank you for this beautiful day, dear Lord. We thank you for it being Mother's Day. Our mothers are so blessed. We thank you for the gift of eternal life, dear Lord, that you gave your son on up to the cross. We ask you that you bless all the offerings, her tithes, her time, anything that we do in your honor, dear Lord. Bless these gifts as we return them to you in all these things we ask in your name. Amen.
Our second scripture this morning is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, beginning with verse 26. It's a story with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Hear these words from scripture. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go down towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb, silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? And then Philip began to speak. And starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way, rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. There may be no other week during the year when there is more reading done than this first full week of May. You might think, well, Matt, that would make a lot of sense, wouldn't it? There are a lot of schools that are finishing up right now, a lot of students who are probably cramming, who are probably reading and studying, who are up all night trying to catch up on papers and notes and books and things, just trying to get finished for summer. It would make sense that there's that much reading happening. But that's not the kind of reading I'm talking about. I'm talking about the reading that happens in greeting card aisles all over the place. Some of you all are laughing. You know what I'm talking about. I went to the store the other day, and I literally had to wait my turn to get within arm's reach of the Mother's Day cards. I was like a runt piglet just trying to work my way in. And and the thing that for me was kind of frustrating is that I like to read the cards before selecting the best one. Some people I watch just would walk up and grab a card and an envelope and walk to the register. I don't know how you do that. Just grab a card and go. You just make sure that it was the Mother's Day section. You know, I hope they did that. I like to take my time whenever I pick out a card. I like to take my time and read it. I like to think about how the person that I'm getting the card for is going to feel when they read it, when they open it and read it. Do I want them to laugh? Do I want them to cry? Would they? Would they be inspired by what the words say? Are they going to understand the card differently than I understand it? And if I'm shopping at the same store as one of my siblings, I mean, we all know there's a Walmart in more than one town, right? Will they get the same card that I get? I mean, there's 
The odds are slim, but it's happened to me. You know, it's, it makes more sense to get the same gift for somebody. A lot of times we'll give out a list, you know, what do you want? Uh, neckties and socks, that'll be good. Chances are you might give a couple pairs of socks, but the same card, I was thinking about it, it, it gives a new meaning to that old hymn line, what more can he say than to you he's already said? That was, sorry, okay. It's a bad joke, it happens. But there's a lot that goes through my mind when I'm in the greeting card aisle trying to pick out a card. So I imagine then what was going on through the mind of this man in the chariot as he was reading from the prophet Isaiah. Imagine what was going through the mind of Philip as he approaches this scene. Do we understand what we are reading? Philip wasn't one of the original 12 disciples. He never sat at Jesus' feet, but Philip was a deacon in the very first church in Jerusalem. And as a deacon, he waited on tables and distributed food to widows. That's what deacons were originally, humble servants. But before Philip could really develop his abilities as a deacon, we are told in Acts chapter 8 that persecutions against Christians began. And the church kind of disbanded for a time. The persecutors were going door to door, searching every house in Jerusalem for Christians and dragging men and women alike off to jail. You were lucky if you got the word before you got a knock at the door so you could flee the city. And Philip was one of those lucky ones. So Philip the deacon leaves the city of Samaria or leaves to go down to the city of Samaria, and he starts preaching. And as it turns out, Philip was pretty good at it. And he was even willing to cross from Jerusalem into Samaria, a line that many a Jew, no doubt, wouldn't come close to towing in those days. But Philip was a man after Jesus' heart. And no doubt, Peter and John and the others back in Jerusalem got word of Philip's success. We are told in the earlier chapter, uh, chapter 8 of Acts, that Philip, through his preaching and healing and teaching, converted an entire city in Samaria. An entire city he converted. First time out of the gate, first time preaching. That's pretty impressive, I think. And it was the first big missionary success for the deacons and for the apostles, an entire city. Can you imagine how excited Philip was? His first time out as a preacher and he converts an entire city. He may have been thinking, you know, I've, I've really got it. Maybe those around him were thinking, he's got all the right moves. He knows all the right things to say. He's the next big thing, the next big it guy. Maybe he'll be the one that gets sent to the really difficult urban places like Caesarea. And I imagine that when Philip saw the angel of the Lord coming to him, he got a little bit excited about his next big preaching opportunity. And what does the angel say to him? The wilderness road from Jerusalem to Gaza. The wilderness road. Get up and go. That's the way you're going. It's like telling a rookie who's just pitched a no-hitter his first time out in the majors that he's going back down to triple-A ball. Or it's like telling the derby winner to head back towards New Mexico instead of on towards Maryland. I wonder if Philip was stunned or if he argued much at all. That happens, you know. The word of the Lord comes and says, go, and not everybody says, sure. If Philip were like some of us, might he have asked the angel of the Lord if he didn't have his deacons and disciples maybe mixed up a little bit? Are you sure I was the one you're supposed to be talking to? Hadn't you heard about my success in Samaria? Wouldn't my gifts be better served? Couldn't I do more if I was sent to some major urban area where there were tons of people? After all, I converted an entire 
city. No, since his efforts were so successful in Samaria, he is being assigned a deserted stretch of road without a single village, a wilderness road. And this waste of a landscape will be joined by a waste of talent, a waste of Philip's talent. But then this is the Lord we're talking about, isn't it? We might want to suspect that something is up. Philip is obedient. He got up and he went. And he sees a man in a chariot and we're told he goes over to him. Well, if we read it closely, we're told he goes over to him after he is ordered by the Spirit of the Lord to go and to approach the chariot. Philip is obedient, but he's not very proactive, is he? Maybe he's a little frustrated and bitter. And we can identify with that, can't we? We would call ourselves obedient, but many times we aren't rushing out to do anything until we can see the entirety of the big picture. So Philip comes over to this man in the chariot. But see, Luke, who is the author of Acts, in writing this, Luke is a little bit more specific about this man in the chariot. This isn't just any man. He starts off by saying this is an Ethiopian. And we ought to be thinking here, when we read Ethiopian, we ought to be thinking ends of the earth. Remember, remember Acts 1.8 you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jerusalem, yeah, we know about Jerusalem. We've even heard a little bit about Judea out in the countryside. We know Samaria has been touched on a whole city, we're told, by Philip. The ends of the earth, that's what's next. This Ethiopian is headed back towards the ends of the earth. I can't imagine somewhere that from Jerusalem sounded more like the ends of the earth than Ethiopia. This man is also a eunuch. Now, not being too familiar in our day and time with what a eunuch is, I think we need to understand a bit more about what this man had experienced. When I was teaching this story to a group of high schoolers, one time, one of the girls asked an obvious question. Well, how did Philip know this man was a eunuch? Well, the man probably didn't tell Philip. He didn't have to, and there was no physical exam. The simple answer is the right one. He looked like a eunuch. And by that I mean that eunuchs had some external physical characteristics that made them obviously stand out in a crowd. Whether this man was castrated as a child before the onset of puberty or after reaching manhood, there were some different physical characteristics that all eunuchs shared. First, because their source of testosterone was removed, their bodies took on certain aspects usually regarded as feminine. Their skin would become uniquely wrinkled, their hairline would grow in a more feminine pattern. And lastly, their skin would take on a sallow color. And of course, there were other changes as well because of the changes in hormone levels. A teenage voice, a gangly appearance because of irregular bone growth. All in all, eunuchs displayed both characteristics of young and old, masculine and feminine. But there are some other things that we need to understand as well about eunuchs, and maybe particularly this eunuch. We are told he's a court official of the Queen of Ethiopia, that he is, he is in charge of her entire fortune, the entire fortune of Ethiopia this man is in charge of. And that kind of responsibility isn't just handed off to anyone necessary for the survival of any monarchy, especially those with roots in tribalistic organization, is unquestionable loyalty. That's what was most important, unquestionable loyalty. And eunuchs were loyal. 
Why? They had no roots. Typically, young boys were captured on slave raids or on other military operations and were sold to the palaces. And whether they were castrated as young boys or they were adults who were punished in the same manner, the point is they had no roots. They were taken away from their families. They had been plucked away from their family. Their family ties were severed. But they were also unable to ever produce children. So they were not only geographically separated from their family, but they were also biologically separated from their family. And see, if they didn't have any ties anywhere else, if they didn't have any biological connection to anyone else and couldn't succeed to the throne or have an heir to the throne, they were very safe to keep around. But see, make no mistake, this eunuch is not powerless. See what he comes riding up in. A chariot. A chariot is a symbol of power. Only the wealthy had chariots. They weren't completely powerless. In fact, most scholars place eunuchs within the most intimate and most powerful settings in the monarchies of that time. They would have been well-educated, He's reading, right, when he comes up. He doesn't have somebody else reading. He is reading himself from Isaiah. He would have been vested with power and control because he could be trusted. And eunuchs even served in the military in leadership capacities. This is the man that we meet on the wilderness road from Jerusalem to Gaza. He's a court official of the queen of Ethiopia who is in charge of her entire treasury and he had come to worship in Jerusalem and was on his way home. And that he went to Jerusalem to worship means that if he wasn't a Jew, and he very well could be, if he wasn't, he at least had a soft spot for the story. And for this man, the story he is reading is from Isaiah chapter 53. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation, for his life is taken away from the earth? Now we read that chapter of Isaiah, and we call it the suffering servant. We especially read it around Christmas time as we're approaching Advent. And we often think about Jesus, but that isn't what this man is thinking about. He's thinking, like a sheep, I was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb silent before its shearer, so I did not open my mouth. In my humiliation, justice was denied me. Who can describe my generation? For my life is taken away from the earth. That's why he he asked Philip, who is this man talking about? Who is this prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? And he's saying, because I can identify with him. He's talking about my story. He's naming what I feel. He's talking about what I experience every single day as I go about my duties. When I wake up in the morning, when I go through my routine during the day, when I lay my head on the pillow at night, this is my story. That I was slaughtered. That I was humiliated. That justice has been denied me. That I don't have a generation to even describe. Tell me he knows my story. And Philip does him one better. He says, let me tell you about the story of Jesus. And Philip tells him the good news. The same good news that Philip had proclaimed in Samaria. The same good news that captured Philip's heart and called him to being a servant. He told the man in the chariot that good news. And I think, you know, we often talk about the good news as being the rest of the story. That's usually where the good news is, right? At the end of the story. And I wonder if part of that good news that Philip told the eunuch was the rest of the story from Isaiah. After all, Luke, the writer of Acts, 
does quote Isaiah quite a few times. And if we read just a little bit further past chapter 53, we will find these words. Do not let the foreigner join to the Lord, say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And do not let the eunuch say, I am just a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast to my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. What a promise of fertility to one who has been cut off. What a word of hope to one who cannot trace their name into the future. It echoes the promise that is given to Abraham that there will be an inheritance passed on in which others will be blessed. And here's the one thing we need to understand, I think. This isn't about going backwards and undoing what has already been done. This isn't even about going backwards and doing things the old way. That's impossible. Biologically, that's impossible. This is about reimagining what it means to be fertile, to have potency, to be a part of the co-creative act of bringing new life. And as it was for this eunuch, so it is for all of us. I wonder this morning, are you more than anything desiring new life in your existence right now? And yet you are feeling cut off. You are feeling like your potency has been extinguished. That any hopes of fertility, of new growth, of new life are seemingly impossibly far away. Maybe you felt that way about yourself, about relationships in your family. Maybe about a job that there's just nothing new that's possible. Maybe you feel that in your daily routines. Maybe you feel that about this world. Can anything new come from so much that is dead all around me? Maybe you feel that way about your church. I've heard that fear voiced quite a few times. Are we going to make it? Is there a future? Can anything new happen in this place? There's so much gray around. Can anything happen? Well, hopefully, just stay here long enough. We'll get some new life around here. I've heard that fear, but you see, the thing that I'm hearing even louder than that is this. Do not say, I am a dry tree. To those who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast to my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give you an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. What a promise that is ours to claim. A promise for all of us in this place and in every place. It's an, it's an invitation to reimagine what the future looks like. Not to rethink the old ways of the past, not to think back through how we found new life before. But now, for the future, how do we reimagine what new life looks like? And it will be as obvious to us as water in the middle of the desert. When the Ethiopian eunuch saw it, he said, What hinders me? from being baptized? What hinders me from becoming like you, one who follows Jesus? And the way I read it, not a word, not a phrase, just a willingness 
to get out of the chariot and to say yes. I wonder as we go into this week, if you would spend some time this week, in a morning, in an afternoon, in an evening, when you have some free time, spend some time being open to the reimagining of what new life might look like in your life, in this place, around you, where you are. Spend some time thinking about that and write it down. And don't write it down like you're going to drop something in a suggestion box. But write it down as a covenant between you and God that you are going to partnership with what God is doing new in this place and in your life and all around you. And commit to being a part of that new life that is all around us. May it be so for each of us this day. Amen. Our hymn of opportunity is number 450. I need thee every hour. If there is any decision that you would make as we stand and sing together, will you come? Let's stand together. worship this morning on this beautiful Mother's Day. If you hadn't gotten that card in the mail, make sure you do that first thing on Monday. And remember, stamps have gone up a little bit. Let's receive the benediction. Brothers and sisters, remember this morning, we've stirred the waters of baptism. Now as you walk out from this place on this other side of the tomb, as your bodies stir the air that you come in contact with, remember that you go with Christ. You go with Christ wherever you go. So keep a watchful eye. There may be water all around. Amen.